And Mr. Tom Eubanks will now offer an invocation. Dear God, thank you for this game we love and for the strength of those who play it. Please keep the coaches, teammates, and opponents from injury. Give them grace in defeat and victory. Your matchless love to show. Bless all who helped invest in them, whose wisdom helped them grow. We know it's just a game, dear Lord, but how we love it so. Amen. Amen. All right, well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. We've, uh, we've got such a great crowd. Before I uh, begin the program, I'm gonna ask all the panelists uh, to come up. So, Mr. Plump, if you wanna lead the way, but if you're on the panel, come on up. And as, uh, as they're coming up, I do wanna introduce a couple special guests. We have way too many guests, which is a great thing for us to introduce everybody, but 
A couple people I do want to recognize. Uh, one of my great friends, Mr. Hallie Bryan is here. Hallie. Uh, Uh, Howley was 1953 Mr. Basketball, was an All-American at IU, and a Harlem Globetrotter. Truly one of the finest people uh, that I've ever met. Let's go. Come on, Bobby. Get up here. Um, we have Ralph Taylor. Mr. Ralph Taylor, um, just a great player at Purdue University. And, uh, also a good friend. We've got uh, Chris May from the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame. Where are you, Chris? Uh, just does a tremendous job running the uh, running the museum there. Chris usually moderates panels like this, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best to uh, to emulate you. Uh, a lot of great Butler folks, great great donors. I appreciate you being here. And then a special guest uh, who drove up uh, from Louisville today is my mom. Uh, mom, so raise your hand. Maris and Angelo, if you if you can come up or. To get you started. I really brought my mom because I, I, um, well, I wanted to see her, but she can actually verify that I watched this movie once a week growing up. And she, can, she can verify that. So as Angelo comes up, uh, really the goal today was to recognize the movie Hoosiers for, for its 35th anniversary. And uh, it's such a special movie uh, to so many of us. And uh, it, again, it, it really meant a lot to me growing up. And we just wanted to recognize it. You know, I, I could go on and on about the accolades, but uh, it's been ranked by USA Today as the greatest sports movie of all time. I think that deserves a round of applause. Uh, I was ranked number 13 by the American Film Institute on its 100 years, 100 cheers list of most inspirational films. Uh, and in 2001, uh, it was selected for preservation in the United States National Film Registry by the Library of Congress as being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant, due in part to an especially large number of nominations from in Indiana citizens. So I could go on and on about the movie. Uh, I think most of you... Uh, has anyone not seen it? Because um, we do have security. We have, we have security here. Um, we can get you out of here. I want to do a brief introduction of these panelists. And again, uh, I could go on and on about their bios, but we've shortened them so we can get to the questions. But uh, first of all, really, really honored to have Mr. Angelo Pizzo here, uh, who drove up from Bloomington. Uh, Angelo is the writer and was the co-producer of this film. Uh, he viewed the story as being more about redemption, second chances, and relationships than about sports. Uh, Hoosiers was directed by his best friend from Indiana University, David Anspaugh. Uh, seven years later, they reteamed to make the college football movie Rudy. We'll probably do a, we might do a program around Rudy too, Angelo, so we may get you back. Uh, he received his degree from IU and won the Distinguished Alumni Award in 2010. Uh, Brad Long, who played Buddy in the movie Hoosiers, uh, kind of had a bad attitude, I think, at the uh, beginning of the film. Uh, he played high school ball at Center Grove and continued on at Southwestern College in Kansas. Uh, his friends encouraged him to go to the casting call for Hoosiers, and he was selected to play, again, team captain Buddy Walker. Uh, he lives in Indianapolis and works as a sales rep for Jostens. Um, Maris Valenis, I think we remember you for uh, your role as Jimmy Chitwood in the film. Uh, Maris was the only uh, non-high uh, school player, basketball player uh, in the movie, but he was uh, an all-city championship golfer and a casting director. I'd love to hear about this story. A casting director spotted him shooting hoops at an open gym uh, one night. And uh, Maris lives in Indianapolis and works in construction management. We have Bob Gardner, who's the events coordinator at the Hoosier Gym in Knightstown. I uh, highly encourage you to get there if you haven't. Uh, in his book, Hoosiers, 11 Life Lessons, he explores the changes people need to make without changing their core values. Uh, good friend of mine, Tom Kohlmeyer. Tom 
I'm probably going to give your age away here, but Tom was three years old uh, when Mr. Plump hit that shot for Milan in 1954. Uh, he sits on the boards of the 1954 Milan Museum, and I would say that museum would not be there in Milan without Tom Kohlmeyer and what he does for it. Uh, he works uh, for CMAC Incorporated and lives in Noblesville. By the way, I want to recognize two other people from the museum, uh, Don Brochet and Tim Molinari, really do a great job keeping that museum alive, so raise your hand. And then not, last but not least, uh, Mr. Bobby Plump, uh, hit the greatest shot in basketball history. But um, he was selected as Indiana Mr. Basketball in 1954, also named one of the 50 great sports figures from Indiana in the 20th century, and according to Sports Illustrated, one of the most noteworthy Hoosiers of the 20th century by Indianapolis Monthly. Uh, I, I can say this as a friend. I want to remind you, we have five other people on this panel, and we only got an hour, so... <laughs> I hope you'll forgive me. So let's roll into the questions. I'm going to ask a bunch of questions, and then we'll have time at the end for you all to uh, ask some questions as well. I want to start out with Angelo. Um, does it feel like 35 years? Does it feel like 35 years? Uh, yes and no. I mean, the um, it feels like forever ago that we actually made the movie. And one of the things that I was I made note of walking into here was the, if you guys recall, uh, this is where we had the uh, reception after the premiere of Hoosiers at the Circle Theater. And I may not have been in this building for 35 years. <laughs> so um, it brings back a lot of memories, but it does seem a long time ago. On the other hand, um, because the, the film has sustained in culture, in our culture, for such a long time, it's always there. It always it re reminds me, uh, I'm, I'm always reminded of it. Um, ordinarily, I would never think of it, but <laughs> I can't avoid uh, when, when people like Bob put on events on a constant basis, um, then uh, yeah, it does, it, it does seem like both a long time ago and yet still present. Can you take us through the evolution of you know, first writing the script and then getting it to Hollywood to believe in it. You know, I've heard those stories and it just seemed almost, not that it wasn't a great script, but almost a miracle how you got that. Um, you, you fought a lot of battles to get people to believe in it. Well, let me first say that I will not give Bobby any time to speak if I actually answer that question in its totality, okay? Um, uh, let me do a very brief version of it uh, because one of the things that uh, is interesting about the, the evolution of the, the script to getting our opportunity to make the film was uh, about three and a half years of people saying no. Uh, and we submitted it to everyone uh, that we could think of who, we had a list of people who either were from Indiana, who we knew loved basketball, were from the Midwest, mm -hmm. uh, had some connection to what the subject material was about, and they all said no, um, including Mel Simon, uh, and, uh, who had a viable film company at the time. I uh, remember one of the comments that um, was made, but I'm not going to even tell you who, because you'll know who she is. Well, um, the, the, uh, the, the re response to reading the script by Mel Simon's company was, well, maybe the, all of us here in Indiana will like it. I doubt if anyone outside of the sit, uh, state lines will like it. So that's one, the reason we got rejected by our Indiana faithful. Um, the interesting thing about why, how this movie finally got in front of the right eyes is it was, uh, it was read by someone who had never seen a basketball game or even heard of the state of Indiana. And uh, this is how the vagaries of why films get made and don't get made are so strange. First of all, this guy was, um, he named John Daly, uh, Handel Productions. John was actually managing um, uh, 
and, and this is, very few people know this, he had a, he put together a huge kind of film uh, uh, fund that was laundered mafia money through uh, Credit Lyonnais in Paris. When he read the script, he cried throughout the script, and he had a rule, if I ever cry in the script, I'm gonna find out how to get it made. The reason he cried, and the reason he responded to it was because his, John was an athlete, uh, grew up in the south side of London, not very poor, um, and he was a boxer and he was a, a soccer player, and his father was an alcoholic who would show up drunk to some of his matches and embarrassed him. And the relationship between Shooter and his father, uh, I mean, Sh Shooter and his son, um, hit him in a deep place. We didn't find this out until later because we were shocked that this, this Brit wanted to make this movie. And, and so that was sort of the catalyst and everything kind of fell into place after that. I mean, there's a lot more to it, but that, that's a part of the story I thought I'd share. Yeah, I, I love the persistence. I listened to a podcast recently that you did and I didn't realize the, um, the possibility of Jack Nicholson playing the role of, of uh, Coach Norman Dale. Can you, can you brief, briefly mention that? Yeah, I skipped that part because I knew it would take too long. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, at one time, uh, David uh, was, was, was friends with Jack because David worked for the Aspen Speed Ski Corporation, and he um, was the host when Jack would come into town and he taught his daughter how to ski. And the, we slipped him the script. We actually slipped him the script in order to give us some advice about how to raise money for it, uh, because we knew he was a fan, and we knew that he had just made a movie, a small independent film called Drive, he said, which is about a small college basketball team set in Ohio. And um, he didn't realize that we were uh, doing it for that. He thought, he, when he read it later, uh, that uh, it was on a pile of scripts that we left, that um, we were offering, he thought we were offering Tim to act in, and he read it and he called up Dave and he said, I love it, I'll do it. So we spent about four months in negotiation with him, and it fell apart only because he was in a lawsuit with MGM about another film, and then he had committed to do the sequel to Chinatown, which the two Jakes, the following year, and he said, well, I'm not gonna be available for three years, give it to Hackman or Duvall. So, um, that's how close we came to having a different kind of movie. What about casting Dennis Hopper? How did that come along? Well, that was just, again, very serendipitous. That we, went, we went through and we, I actually wrote it for Harry Dean Stanton and Harry Dean turned it down and we looked at a lot of other actors and David happened to be in a restaurant one night and he saw Dennis. And we were under the assumption that Dennis had just dropped out of the business because of you know alcohol or drug problems. And he had, uh, he really hadn't worked in about 10 years. And David introduced himself and asked Dennis if he was, you know, if he was working again. And he, Dennis said, I did a small Canadian film that no one's seen, but uh, so David came to me and asked me and, and we brought it up to uh, Carter DeHaven, uh, my co-producer, and Carter said, no, the insurance company will never bond us if we do that. But we we had invited him in to talk to us and he walked in the room, he sat down, and I remember the first thing that came out of his mouth, I know this man. And boy, he said it from a very deep place. And, and David and I just knew in his vulnerability and his sweetness and his uh, really sense of, of of our belief that, that he would inhabit the role in a way, in a dimensional way where we couldn't imagine anybody else doing it. So we fought for him and we got the, the waiver from the insurance company. Yeah. Last question for you and then I'm gonna ask Brad and Maris some questions. The choice to cast real Indiana high school players when you could have gone with Hollywood actors, take us through that decision. Well, that was pre-planned. When I say pre-planned, it was uh, in the writing. Uh, what I uh, chose to do was to never give any one player more than three or four lines so there was no heavy lifting in terms of acting. That's where, actor, that's where non-actors are exposed. They're exposed to dialogue, usually. And uh, of course we gave 
the, the, the person who we thought would be the, the most important in terms of their skill set, the least a number of lines possible. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, it was... Uh, I don't say much anyway. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. We cast uh, the part the right, way, uh, the right way here. But uh, the thing about... Uh, that always bothered me and, and David in watching all the sports zones were actors who were cast in important roles who had to be convincing players who couldn't play at all. It would just take us out of the movie. I remember one of the, it was Jimmy Pearsall in Fear Strikes Out. He couldn't throw a baseball. Um, as the same, and the same way with uh, Robert De Niro and, and Bang the Drum slowly. So that was our intention. And, and that's what, that's uh, how we executed it. So Brad and Maris, can you talk us through how you found out about the film, the whole process of trying out, and, and, and what that was all like for you guys? Go ahead, Mars. Oh, I gotta learn how to turn this thing on. It's on. Hello. Yep. <laughs> you did a good job. Thanks. Uh, for me, uh, it was a big deal here in Indiana, Indianapolis, basically. Um, it was on the news that they were going to have open casting. I think it was down at IUPUI, if I remember right, a, a gym down there. Um, and they were going to have it on Monday night, and, or Monday during the day and Tuesday during the day. Um, I think I was 22 at the time, something like that. I can't, it's hard for me. It's been so long, I can't remember. Um, but I had no intention of, of going down there and auditioning. So Monday, um, I did, did not go to the auditions. But on Monday nights, I always played pickup ball at St. Luke's Gym, Catholic uh, grade school. Uh, and there was a bunch of guys that always played there every single Monday night. Almost didn't go that night to play pickup ball because it was my girlfriend's dad's birthday. But I decided not to go to that. It's <laughs> a good decision. To play basketball. So somebody that had auditioned uh, Monday during the day told uh, Ken Carlson and a couple other people that we played, not me specifically, but a bunch of guys played at St. Luke's Gym. So that night they came by and for whatever reason I was just chucking up everything and making everything that night. And uh, so Ken, after the night was over, came up to me and gave me his card and said, uh, come down tomorrow and audition. And I think he gave me a time or something. So, so I went down there the next day, walk into the gym, and I look and there's 500 people in line. <laughs> and I go, he must have just told everybody their brother to come on down. And so I, I looked at the end of the line, I looked at the doors, and I literally was about to turn around and walk out. And then Ken came out, saw me, and took me ahead of all those other people. <laughs> so that was the start of it, and, and uh, uh, I was this close to not even auditioning. So. Can I add, let's add another back, interesting background for, for this young man here. Um, he did not play high school basketball. He was cut from every time he tried out. So, yes, uh, that's irrelevant. Uh, <laughs> no, freshman year I got cut, sophomore year I got cut, junior year I got cut, and I don't remember if I tried out my senior year, I might have gotten tired of it. Something wrong with that coat. <laughs> and, but then the funniest part is, so we needed to fill up Hinkle Fieldhouse uh, with some so we had a high, they had a high school game that we did some shooting around. My high school coach and our team was one of the teams that played. Is that right? Yeah, you didn't know that? I may have known it. So, so uh, Chitar, Mr. Stevenson was the head coach, and he, so what, what, after at halftime he came up to me and just shook my hand and just said, "Hey, sorry about that." <laughs> Right. <laughs> Still had eligibility. No, we were done. <laughs> uh, what about you, Brad? Yeah, my story is a little different than Mars. I had to work for my part. Uh, <laughs> no, long story short, I was uh, the oldest player. Um, I was 23. I just graduated college that spring, 
And there was articles in the paper saying they were looking for 18 to 20 year olds to portray this Hickory High School basketball team. So I felt like I was too old. I was 23. And at that time, back when I had hair, I looked young for my age. It's going the other way now, but right, 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 Tom? <laughs> um, so long story short, I ended up you know, at the kind of the urging of some friends trying out, just like Mara said, down at IUPUI. Uh, you know, we did some drills, we did a little reading, uh, and you know, it's just, I always call it a lucky break. You know, I, Angelo said it, most sports movies uh, look for basketball players or football players, whatever the movie's about, and hope they can act. I always have said all these years later that they looked for basketball players and hope they could act rather than actors and hope they could play basketball. So they did take a chance on us, and like Angelo said, didn't give us too many lines, you know, so we couldn't mess it up too badly. Uh, but that cattle call at IUPUI, and Angelo, you can correct me, but I think I think they looked also in LA and Chicago. Did they go, was it just Indianapolis? Uh, no, we actually, uh, we tried some people out who uh, were submitted to us in, in Los Angeles, which is yeah. where we got David Nidor. Yeah, that's what I thought. And uh, so everybody, every player is gonna have their own story, but I went through the call outs, the practices, uh, the, you know, the tryouts, and one thing that may have helped my cause, I have to ask Angelo of this all these years later, but he took me aside, I think when I was reading, and he said, by any chance are you related to Gary Long? And I said, well, yeah, that's my dad. And he kind of stepped back, he said, I used to rebound basketballs for the IU basketball team as a 10 year old in the old IU field house. And my dad played at IU, some, some of you out there might remember him. He was captain in 61, played for McCracken. He and Walt Bellamy were classmates. And the thing about that, though, I'll never forget, Angelo said he's the only player that as a 10 year old boy, when I would pass the ball back to him, he said, thank you. And, and that always stuck with me. So it pays to be nice. Like <laughs> M M Mrs. Wood always said, it pays to be nice. But anyway, so cut to the chase. So after all of the reading and tryouts, and that may have helped my cause, I don't know. Uh, but kind of fit a character they were looking for. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, Graham mentioned I was the troublemaker. My wife said I was typecast with that role. I don't know about that. But I got to kind of play, and I, I played college basketball. I had a lot of my teammates say, man, Long, you know, we don't ever remember you talking back to the coach like that. And I told him, I said, that's what made it fun to kind of get to kind of, out of come out of my skin and get to play kind of a, a different character. But um, that's kind of my story. One thing led to another. I think it got whittled down, Morris, to about 15 of us or so. We went through readings um, with David and Angelo and uh, eventually cut it to the final eight. That was kind of my story. Well, let me just jump in here and talk about our process. What we did was we had we actually saw over a thousand um, tryouts, uh, players in the tryouts, and we um, we narrowed it down based strictly on the look of the player. Did they look like they were Hoosiers, and could they play? How good were they? So our initial cut was to seventy-five, and we brought that seventy-five into smaller groups at uh, the. Um, you remember the where where we everybody was housed? It was in a motel. Uh, uh, it used to used to be the uh, I think it was the uh, Ramada Inn. Yes, right. Up on That's 38th right. Yeah, yeah, on 38th. Yeah, yeah. On 38th. Yeah. So so we would bring in these uh, groups and we would read them, have them read through the script, and so it was a process of a week. We started narrowing down. So it wasn't 15, it was 75 to 50 to 40 to 30. So you guys had to make a lot of cuts in order to get to that final eight. So Morris and Brad, what was it like you were around, you know, these esteemed actors, Dennis Hopper, Gene Hackman. I'm not gonna ask any Barbara Hershey stories. If you want, <laughs> well, I, I would encourage you to listen to Angelo's podcast, but we're not gonna bring her up today. But what was it like being around those, you know, really, really famous actors at, at a young age? Yeah, Morris, I know we'll have his take on this too, but one of the things I was most impressed with, with Gene Hackman, you know, here's a guy that had been Lex Luthor, Popeye Doyle, uh, he was in, a, a, you know, done, done a lot of movies, and, you know, he was very well known, and could have been a guy, in my view, that could have come in, been a real prima donna, said, show me my spots, give me my lines, get out of my way, and Gene didn't do that. Uh, he said, I want to learn, you know, I want, he had never played a high school basketball coach, I don't think. And so we went, if you remember guys, we went to high school practices. Howard Leedy, I think that time was a coach at Brownsburg and Kent played for him and we set it up, I think at Brownsburg, Angel, if I remember right. The IHSA was involved, made sure everything was legit. And um, Gene would go watch 
uh, Howard conduct practice. And I think that was really valuable because I think he learned little things like verbiage, you know, block them out. He, he, you know, he, he knew about basketball, but he didn't really know uh, the ins and outs and the verbiage that coaches use and things like that. So I've always been really impressive with that with Gene. Dennis was just a good old boy. I mean, what a, what a great guy. And the thing I remember about Dennis is he was very open and honest about all the, 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 the demons that he had had. He told me one time that he missed the 1970s. He doesn't remember <laughs> a whole decade. Uh, you, know, you know, he finished up with Easy Rider there at the end and Apocalypse Now was uh, then the next movie he did after, after that. So the point of that story is that he, like Angelo said, he was wanting to kind of come back a little bit and, and, and overcome some of those addictions that he had and always admired that uh, about Dennis, that he did that. Shev Woolley, I gotta tell you about Shev. How many of you in here know this? You're gonna win money on this trivia question. But Shev Woolley, who played Cletus, had a number one hit in 1957. Who knows what it is, anybody? Flying Purple People Eaters. Flying Purple People Eaters, yeah. <laughs> Chef Woolley sang Flying Purple People Eaters in 1957. That was a number one hit. A lot of people don't know that, so that's a good, good trivia question. And Barbara, I had no trouble with Barbara. She was nice to me, and, uh, you know, Angelo can expand on this a little bit more. I think she felt like she wasn't portrayed quite like she thought she was going to be in the script, but, you know, she came off as kind of a school mark, but that's what she was. So, anyway, all I'll say about that. But the, I got along fine with all of them. They were very respectful, and I think you tend to think of actors as uh, unapproachable, kind of a, a, and really they're very down to earth. It's almost like they're almost shy offset, and they let themselves go on camera. But that was my experience. They are. Other actors aren't that way. <laughs> but, I mean, my experience with uh, Gene and Dennis, um, I, I know of one instance. Gene always, the players, he always treated us with respect and uh, included us in things. I mean, Monday Night Football, he'd invite us to go watch the, the Bears in Miami play. The first time he ever laid a bet on a football game and lost because he bet on Chicago. Um, <laughs> and Dennis, we used to play cards with him in the trailer and stuff. Um, so they were, both very, very kind to us. Um, I just remember one instance, uh, I think Angelo and David had a little different experience with him. Um, and I don't know why I remember this. I think we were at Nineveh High School or something. He was getting a little bit upset uh, about what I don't remember, but he, his comment to you guys was, this is gonna be another Heaven's Gate. I remember that very clearly. And, uh, Many. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you have a lot of different other stories about that. So he treated us good. I mean, I sometimes think he did that just to kind of stir the pot and kind of get his juices flowing so that maybe he had more energy when he was acting or something. But, but you probably have a better insight on that than I do. Let's move on. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, that's all right. You want no, to I, will, I, I'm gonna, I'll, I will jump in here and, 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 and briefly say that in terms of the Gene did have respect for me and the writing process. He came from the theater, and the theater, um, in the theater, if you ever change a line, uh, you have to get permission from from the writer. I mean, that is totally ignored uh, about 99% of the time in film, but not Gene. Gene would come to me with uh, asking me about line changes all the time. So in that area, he did, he did respect me, but as a producer, he did not, and that's something else. Uh, but uh, the, the, um, <clears throat> the thing about, uh, uh, about uh, Gene, that is correct about what he said. We found out later, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna get to that second part. What I meant to say was, he did like to stir the pot. He did like to create a, a, a dark energy on the screen because he fed off of it. And he beat David up on a regular basis. He was very, very disrespectful to David and, and he was hard on David. And, and, and I think in part because he was a little nervous because David was nervous. David had never done a feature film before. Gene uh, and actors, in order to get to a vulnerable place, they have to count on 
kind of the, 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 the leadership, the guidance, and the, the, um, the, the perspicacity of, of, of the director to know, you know whether they're, they're in the right place or not, because they're, they're acting from a subjective place. And David was just unsure of himself, that, especially that first two or three weeks. And, and Gene, it just drove Gene insane, and he started really being brutal on us. He thought, one of those lines was, he walked out on, to the first time we walked out on the set of, uh, it was in New Richmond, and it was the barbershop scene, ex exterior of the barbershop scene, we actually cut that. And uh, I don't think it's in your version, but uh, it, 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 he went nuts. He said, what is this, Doc Patch? Am I a little Abner? This is a comic book character movie? This is absurd. Oh my God, my career is in the dumpster. This is a disaster, you know? And he just, he went back to his trailer, refused to come out. That was kind of a daily thing for him. So uh, until, honestly, Dennis arrived. Dennis arrived three weeks into the film. I never saw De uh, Gene smile or laugh once, but you know, the one, they hit it off. They had respect for each other, but more than anything, Dennis was an hysterical guy, and he made Gene laugh, and it kind of let, uh, it kind of lifted his spirits just a little bit. We we still called him the Black Cloud, uh, Gene. But uh, uh, and David started to get his footing. He started to feel a little more secure. So we had uh, at least uh, some measure of equilibrium um, it, by the end of the film. But I will say, one of Gene's send off uh, comments to to us before he, uh, he got on the, he said, he, this was at, at Hinkle, and, and he was finally released on the last shot, and he wasn't gonna even come over and say hi to us. You know, we were notified he's gonna leave, so we had to go to him, thank you, thank you, thank you. He said, well, listen, um, I hope you guys learned a lot, you know, and I hope your friends and family and the people here in Indiana will enjoy it. I doubt if anybody will ever see this movie. Uh, it, it, it is likely gonna end up in the dustbin of film history like so many other movies. And he said, I'm sure you'll remember it the rest of your lives. I hope I forget it by the time I land in Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah, he was, was our send off. Yeah, he was quoted as saying it was gonna be a career killer. I think right yes, before. Uh, he did. Before, uh, now, I will also have to add one other thing. We had to, there was a lot of looping we had to do because um, we were recording these uh, you know, live shots in basketball arenas and we had him speaking and it was all muddled. So we had, we had to bring him in and his response to bringing him in for looping was that he had to see the rough cut first and if he didn't like it, he wasn't gonna do it. And we would have to find a voice actor to, to imitate him. And we got notification, he saw the film, and then he agreed to come in and, and, and loop the film. And he didn't even make a comment. But we, I said, well, he must have liked it enough that he's coming. So David and I, were, we hadn't seen him in about a year. We were really nervous. He walks in and he had this kind of grim expression on his face. And he walked over and shook each of our hand. He said, I don't know how the hell you did it, but you pulled it off. <laughs> okay, Mr. Plum, finally gonna get to you. You know, I read about the first time that you saw the movie in the theater and how emotional that was for you. What, what was that like for you and your teammates seeing this play out on screen? I like the ending. <laughs> you know, the first time uh, I saw the movie, uh, Angelo invited the team in just for a sneak preview of the movie Hoosiers and the Indianapolis Star asked me to write a column on what I thought about it and that alone was a little bit unusual since English was my foreign language but I, I as the opening film they were driving through the country and that was you know it brought back so many memories and I wrote three sentences I became so engrossed in the movie when I got out of there, that's all that was on my sheet were three sentences. So I had to improvise. I called them and told them what I thought of the movie. I loved it. I, I just, uh, you know, I laughed, I cried. Uh, 
it was it was a tremendous tremendous movie and i remember angelo you called me aside after it was over and you said what do you think of the movie and i said i i loved it angelo and he said did we get the last 18 seconds correct and i said you nailed it said, that's exactly what happened what you see in the movie the last 18 seconds is exactly what happened not the huddle i didn't say i'll make it in the huddle but after the ball is thrown in that is the only factual thing concerning Milan in the movie, is the last 18 seconds. We didn't play any of those teams. We never had fights. Our coach never raised his voice. He was never kicked out of a game. But I'm gonna tell you, Angelo and David put together, regardless of what Gene Hackman thought it was gonna be, they put together a movie that resounded not just in the United States, but throughout the world. Ladies and gentlemen, a year and a half ago, because of the movie Hoosiers, I got letters from three kids in Paris, France, asking for my autograph. <laughs> eight months ago, I, did, I never told you this, I don't think, uh, Angelo. Eight months ago, a friend of mine called me and said there's a newscaster, broadcast, a sportscaster from Spain that wants to know if he can talk to you. So that movie just took things worldwide. The little museum in Milan that I have things here and there are t-shirts available and so forth. If you ever get a chance, go down there. I, I was telling our table here, there were two engineering students that's got an eight foot tall board, four foot wide, and they hand wrote all 752 schools that participated in the tournament and followed them out to the final game. That's hanging in there. From 1998 to now, they've had visitors at that Milan Museum from all 50 states and 38 foreign countries, including Saudi Arabia, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. So Angelo, you and David, thank you. You did just one great job, regardless of what anybody else said. It was a great movie. Thank you, Bobby. So, Morris, you and Bobby are sort of connected forever. I mean, you know, when you talk about the film and they talk about you, his name comes up and vice versa. What's that relationship been like for you two? It's perfect because I say nothing and he says everything. <laughs> <laughs> Just throw them out in the front and we're good. Now I know why they only gave you a few lines. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm honored to have portrayed him in the movie. I mean, it's just, uh, I remember when I was a kid, my, my parents were uh, from another country. They're from Latvia. Um, so I didn't know a lot of the, when I, up to like six or seven years old, I didn't know a lot of Indiana traditions, but my friends actually had a Super 8 uh, of Milan winning the championship, and we would go over to their house and watch that when we were like seven or eight years old. Up to that point, I, didn't, I knew nothing about it. But uh, I, I learned quickly about Indiana basketball. I want to tell you something. I wish I was as good looking as he was and had as good a shot as he had. Well, well that's not necessarily true because we, we went on that show out in California. Um, I forget right. the sports show or whatever with John Sally and all that. And they had to shoot baskets and he kicked my butt. <laughs> that's when I could still shoot. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take some questions from the audience, but uh, Tom. Uh, and Bob, tell me about what it's like when people come to the Hoosier Gym and to the museum and 35 years later, how they're still impacted by the film and, and, and those emotions and stories that come up. Well, um, it's amazing. Uh, we're doing about 70,000 visitors a year. Uh, he mentioned the countries. We're up to 72 countries uh, around the world. Um, and I think the most important thing is, for me, I played on the last team that played in that gym in 1966. I was a starting center, 5'10". <laughs> Started 20 games at the middle of the bench. That's a funny one. 
Say that in a bitch. Time, timing must have been off. I think that the most amazing thing about when I came back uh, and had visitors come through, I started trying to figure out how 30, then it was 30 years later, people are still coming here to this old building. It was not for the architecture. It was for the impact of the movie Hoosiers. And it was amazing the amount of people who knew line after line after line of the movie. And in questioning people, I came to the impression that not just because he's sitting next to me, but it was not the movie as much as it was the script. You could take this script, stick it in Wisconsin, make it about hockey, and all those lessons that he was trying to teach would be there. And I told him about four years ago, I'm writing a book, 11 Life Lessons on the Movie Hoosiers, and he looked at me like, are you an idiot or what, you know? Are you a writer? No, I'm not a writer. But anyway, I did that strictly because of the impact the movie had had on people's lives. And about four years ago, I had a youth group in, and one of the kids said, that's a horrible basketball movie. I go, well, it's not a basketball movie. The kid go, yeah, it is. Wanted to argue with me. I said, no, it's not. I said, it's a movie about life. And if you learn the 11 life lessons in the movie Hoosiers at your age, you'll have the foundation for great life. If you make it a part of your core values, you will achieve it. And that's what came out of this brilliant script that he wrote. And uh, I'll always be grateful because I hadn't written anything for 50 years. And that's when my editor, Tom Mayhill at the Knightstown Batter, went through and scratched about every line out. Uh, as I was trying to write as a high school senior. But this script gave me the opportunity and, and I'm so glad I did. And it's amazing the amount of impact. To give you an idea, Friday the 13th, we are showing the movie Hoosiers at the gym. And that will be the first time it's ever been shown the way that Angelo actually meant it to be. We put the missing scenes back in where they belong. So Zoe, the young lady who put this together, brilliant. Uh, she and I are gonna watch it together for the first time. So we're sitting there watching it and I'm getting all emotional seeing it that way. There's a scene called the harvest scene that will just knocks my socks off. Anyway, so we get done and I'm so excited. I call Angelo on the phone I said, Angelo, we just watched the way you made it. It's incredible. It's even better. He goes, I know. I wrote it. <laughs> I'd like to say one other thing. I met Gene Hackman when they were filming out at Butler Fieldhouse, and uh, you were on the other end uh, making the basket, and I walked down. Gene was under the basket on the other end. I went in, and I said, Mr. Hackman, I haven't met you. My name's Bobby Plump. He said, get over here. He said, this is what this movie's all about. He said, I know Bill Jordan, one of your teammates. And I said, you're kidding me. Bill Jordan has been an actor in Hollywood since 1963. And what 53 and 54 did, 10 of the 12 of us went to college. Six of them ended up coaching. 10 of 12 went to college in 1954. That's more than went to college from Milan High School in the previous four years. And that filtered on down. That's what 53 and 54 did. And then it was dying down, and then Angelo and David came along and made that great movie. And it's back there again, and it's gonna be there forever. But Gene was a very uh, hospitable person and, uh, for me, and uh, we had a nice conversation. And I know your story, Angelo, and I understand that. But it was, uh, it was, it was fun. I also, I don't know if I heard this, and maybe you know, I, I thought someplace I heard Dennis Hopper say, you know, I've been in a lot of movies. I worked damn hard on all those movies. This one, the easiest movie ever made. I practiced for that role my whole life. <laughs> I'm Tom Colbarn, I'm the president of Milo Museum.
I grew up in Milan. A uh, couple stories. Uh, my dad and mom were at the ball game the night that uh, Milan won, and my mom was pregnant with my younger brother, and they were in the caravan that was coming back to Milan the next day. And uh, when they got to Sunman, which is eight or nine miles away from Milan, dad couldn't contain himself anymore. He said, Phyllis, you take the wheel, I'm walking. He walked to Milan and beat her. Indiana State Police estimates over 40,000 people showed up in Milan that next day. Um, we've had visitors from, like I said, about from around the world. Um, the museum was started by a woman by the name of Rosalind McKittrick. Uh, she had an antique shop, and so she had some Milan memorabilia in there. And then we started the museum, and she asked me to come aboard. And the reason I did was I, my family was in the furniture manufacturing business. Uh, many of you have seen that iconic uh, water tower with Milan 54 state champs on it. My great grandfather built that tower and painted it. Um, but Milan Furniture went out of business. The hospital left, went to Lawrenceburg, and Milan fell into disrepair. And I thought, you know, this would be a chance for me to contribute to Milan. If this museum can be successful, it'll draw people to the town, and maybe we can get a rebuilding and a reconstruction of the town to be what I, I knew when I was a kid. Uh, one other story about the museum, just to show you how things go, we get people from all over the place. I went in there one Saturday and Rosalind was talking to this couple that had driven all the way from Texas to uh, see the museum. And we just talked about the barber shop next door. The, the museum's in a hundred year old bank building. We bought, we, we bought the barber shop to add to the museum. Rosalind says, Tom, I gotta go to the, the barber shop and you help these people here. So we just started talking and we've got a row of lockers that's got memorabilia, uniforms, tennis shoes of all the players that were on the team. and. Um, I took, I said, I'm gonna show you something. You're from Texas. There was a player on the team by the name of Ronnie Truitt. And he uh, went to Houston, and then he went on down to Texas and became a uh, basketball coach and won the state championship in Texas. And I said, this is Ronnie Truitt's uh, uh, locker. He won a state championship down in Texas, and there's a school named after him down there. The blood drained out of both their faces. They said, oh my God, our grandson goes to that school. <laughs> um, we've got all kinds of stories like that, but we, uh, we get visitors from all over the place. Bob sends them over to us. We try to send them over to his, his museum. And all I can say, Mars, Brad, and especially you, Angela, is thank you for keeping the story alive. God bless you. Thank you. I just want to add one thing. Uh, since we were talking about, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we were talking about Gene Hackman earlier, and I want to be sure that you understand too how much of an influence I think it had on Gene. We've all got Gene stories, but I, I always I tell this story wherever I go, and it's I'll never forget it. But we're at Hinkle filming uh, the final game scenes, and I think Entertainment Tonight was there. It was John Hart and Mary, John Tesh and Mary Hart. If you remember that show? And us, you know, we were trying to get a good look at Mary Hart as players. I remember that. Um, but anyway, I digress. So they're interviewing Gene, and one thing he said has always stuck with me, and it's always made me feel good about being uh, a Hoosier and about our basketball heritage and everything. But he said, you know, he said, I've been in a lot of movies, but he said, these are the best extras that I've ever worked with. He said, only in Indiana could you get 8,000 people to come out and cheer for a fake basketball game. <laughs> and that's true, and that's true. So I, I love that story. Thing. Okay, uh, you'll be reading about this in the newspaper soon. Um, Bob and I and um, uh, John Gibson from Christmas Addicts, uh, Graham with Hinkle, uh, Chris May with the Hall of Fame, uh, we have formed a uh, Indiana Basketball Heritage Trail. And um, we're going to be structuring it so that people visiting Indiana or people within Indiana can drive for a couple of days and visit all these sites. And as it becomes more and more popular, we'll add other iconic sites in, uh, uh, in Indiana. Tom is the chair of the... <laughs> Tom is the chair of our museum board. I'd be remiss to say this week any donations made to the museum are being matched. So uh, I, I feel bad, I have to ask for money every hour. That's what I, what I do professionally. But, um, and then $1,954 gets you a lifetime pass to the museum. Let's take a few questions from the audience here. Uh, Hi, I'm Craig Silver. I, I wanted to thank Graham for this program. It was a unique program, and maybe it did something for all the small schools today. Secondly, I wanted to say something about my friend Ray Crow, who was in this movie. 
and uh, we have, uh, you know, he's an unsung hero. And, uh, he was a great man for the city of Indianapolis as a counselor and as a coach. And I'm so glad you had him in this movie, and Ray Crow was a great man also. Can I, can I add to that? Uh, my Uncle Clark, back in the Indiana Central days, was a teammate of Ray Crow uh, at Indiana Central. And I've known Mr. Crow as I was growing up. I got to know him and exactly what you said. He was the, the class of the class. Is a movie with the cuts back in available for purchase? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it, it, the way it is right now, and I cannot review details, but at least for another year or so it will not be available. Other than that, the Hoosier Gym, and we're sold out on the 13th, but we will be showing it again in April. One, one thing I would add to that, um, I think Angelo, it's okay to mention this, there, there is a DVD version. Some of you may have it. Uh, I ha happen to have one. It's the one where if you run your fingers across, it's like the texture of a basketball. Okay. If you, any of you have that, on the back of that, it has the deleted scenes. That, so that's one way to do it, including an interview with David and Angelo and footage of the final game. I believe, is that right, Angelo? It's a two DVD set. And so in essence, you can kind of see, um, you know, the uncut version, um, in, you know, with that DVD set. I was going to have Brad come on the 13th for nothing, but now he just lost it. <laughs> You're not gonna see it, anything though, like until you show up that night. <laughs> 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 but thank you, I wanna, uh, congratulate Graham and uh, all the people who put this program together. My name is Howard Bryant, and no doubt about it, I'm the oldest person in the building here today. But uh, I don't feel like it, but I am. Um, well, thank you. Get that lady's name. <laughs> but you spoke of Coach Gray Crow. He coached me in grade school and high school. That's where Oscar Robinson and I, public school 17, then Christopher's Addicts. But Ray Crow was like a role model. He and my dad were my role models. And he was just class. He didn't take any foolish enough from anybody, anybody. The tough guys in the school, beat up people just build up their reputation. He would get that person. I saw him take one guy out of this. He had his cap on cutting up. He, he pulled, a cap, pulled a cap off the guy's head, stood him up like that. Up and down five, six times across, and him and so put him down the seat. Embarrassed him or anything else. But Ray Crow, he, he was just a genuine person. I want to just say that, but Coach Crow. I've got a couple comments about Ray Crow. Uh, a lot of people don't know that Ray Crow was made the honorary mayor of Milan in 1954. Um, the other Ray Crow story was that uh, Milan beat that, your team uh, in the Senate State, I believe it was. In the Final Four luncheon, um, the coach from here, Terrell Kirschmar, was talking about his team. And he says, you know, my team is like hot water and, and cold water. I can turn them on and turn them off. He says, any way I want to do it. And Ray was sitting in the back of the room, had his hand up, and he goes, yeah, Ray, what do you, what do you got? And he goes, I'm just wondering if you're going to turn, turn that hot water and cold water on when you can't find the ball. <laughs> I want to tell you something about Ray Crow, if you all don't know this. I, I believe this is correct. He coached seven years, didn't he, Hallie, at, at Addicts? He won 172 games and lost 20. 172 wins and lost 20 games in seven years. Now, you, now he was as good a man as he was of that coach and winning that also. He was a super, super individual, Hallie. And by the way, Hallie is the oldest Mr. Basketball living yet in Indiana. So take care, Hallie. And, and we're, we're you did that is uh, only by one year. <laughs> yeah, well, he's got to be, yeah, by, in a lot of ways. Johnny Wilson was the oldest and passed away last year. Johnny Wilk, Jumpin' Johnny, Anderson, yep, yep. And how about it, Carl Erskine? Good time for a couple of last, too. Globetrotter, also. Yeah. Um, Globetrotter. Good time for a couple last questions. Anybody else? Yep, I knew she'd have one. My question's for Angelo. So, um, in the opening scenes of the movie, when the car, you know, Coach Dale's driving to Hickory, and a day not a lot different from this time of year, right? 
and it's the gorgeous Indiana countryside and the music starts to swell and build and I'm guessing like most people in this room like I get a lump in my throat when I hear that soundtrack so my question for you is what influence did you have over the soundtrack with Jerry Goldsmith? Uh, the soundtrack well um, both of our movies uh, the Hoosiers and Rudy would not be uh, the movies they are if it wasn't for his brilliance. Uh, Jerry was one of the it was one of the great uh, uh, composers in the history of soundtracks, of scoring in, in, in film history. Uh, nominated for 18 Academy Awards. Um, we had no shot of getting him, uh, and because we were such a low budget film, and he demanded about, I think around a million dollars per uh, film at that time, and our entire budget was six million. So we only had like 200,000 for a for a budget and for, for a composer. And it just so happened that uh, Carter DeHaven was a friend of Jerry's. And he knew that Jerry um, had a number of young musicians, young composers that he was training, that he was mentoring. And that on occasion, if he felt like they were ready, he would actually supervise their composing for other uh, films. And uh, so we had, uh, we had a screen set up for Jerry to see whether this would qualify for one of his acolytes. And, um, and, and this is something I'll never forget the rest of my life. Uh, and David feels the same way. Uh, he was sitting, he, oddly enough, in the first row uh, of the film. And he, uh, we were in the back row. I mean, it was a small screening room, but still, it was very close to the screen. And he, uh, the, 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 not the end credits, because we were rough cut, the, the movie finished, and Jerry was not moving. He just sat there for what seemed an interminable amount of time, and it turned, uh, and we, we, we thought he was asleep. We were convinced that he had fallen asleep, and we looked at each other, and well, you know, nice try, but no cigar. And he finally gets up when we turn the lights on uh, after five minutes, and he had tears running down his cheeks, and he looked at Carter Dave and said, you son of a bitch. I, you knew I'd fall for this movie, didn't you? <laughs> I gotta do it myself. So that was, uh, that was his brilliance, and, and uh, yeah, it was amazing working with a, a genius like Jerry, uh, and, and to experience seeing those scenes that uh, we worked so hard on, uh, set against uh, that, that, those soundtracks uh, and uh, those pieces uh, while, we, while we were, you know, uh, doing the mix of the film. I want to add a couple other things that people brought up. One is that I grew up two blocks from the old field house. Hallie Bryant was one of my heroes. And you know, Hallie was there when I first started becoming aware of Indiana basketball. Uh, my, my parents moved from Chicago when I was two, so when I was like five, I was actually walking over to watch, watch uh, the IU team uh, practice, and he was one of the people that I remember indelibly etched in my mind. He was, uh, he was a thing of beauty to watch on a basketball floor, and uh, he's a thing of beauty off the basketball floor, too, I will say that. Um, the, the one last uh, uh, grace note uh, to, to button up, I suppose, the Gene Hackman, because we told a lot of Gene Hackman stories, but I will say this. Based on, on the, the, the things that we've said about him, and I've, of course, you know, talked about his, his behavior on the set, the irony is that he did an interview about a year before he retired. He's living in Santa Fe now, not doing film roles anymore. And uh, he was asked, uh, when people see you in public, what character do they identify you with more than anything else, anybody else? I was gonna think, I was gonna, I would have imagined Popeye Doyle in French Connection, and he said, it's the coach in Hoosiers, so. We're gonna do one last question before we wrap it up. I was talking to you here at the table and uh, we were talking about the size of Milan compared to Cambridge City, where I grew up. And uh, with all of the school consolidation, this can never happen again. I'm wondering, what is your impression or opinion 
of class basketball in that <laughs> <laughs> uh, Do we have time for another panel? We, have yeah, another yeah. Time that we, we get kicked out of here too, just so you know. <laughs> it's it's probably such a soft table. Two or three more, maybe five or six more meetings and get to that, but I will say that the people spoke with their feet because the first, the last year of the single class tournament, 860 some thousand came to the tournament. The first year of the multi-class, we had class basketball. Now we have multi-class. The first year of the multi-class, 485,000, and they have not been back to that since. So enough said. As Trina's coming up here, uh, I do have one last question. I get the last word in. Morris, you probably don't remember this. Uh, a few years back, I was behind you in line, in the security line at the Indianapolis airport. And I could see as you were walking through, you'd get all these people kind of, <laughs> I think I know him. How, how often do you get that? Um, more so on the basketball court. I still play basketball um, in California or here. Um, more so on the basketball court. A lot of times, I, if I'm in a crowded area or something, somebody might, like an airport or something like that, once in a while, I'll notice somebody looking at me kind of funny. Um, <laughs> and they might say, I, I think I know you, or something like that. If they don't come right out and say it, that uh, were you in the movie Hoosiers, I usually go, I have a familiar face or something. Because <laughs> I, I, I don't know, maybe they just think they know me. I don't, I don't know, so I don't make a big deal of it or whatever. But um, it, it still happens, it's just kind of shocking. Yeah. yeah. And Graham, that's a, that's a good story. My story is they come up to me and say, excuse me, sir, was your son in Hoosiers? <laughs> that's my boy. Um, as we wrap up, uh, how about a big round of applause for these guys? They've they made such an, yeah, stand up. Uh, They've made such an in indelible impact on, on Indiana and Indiana basketball history. And the one comparison I would make is um, I'm a pretty big Beatles fan. And I think in a hundred years, people will be listening to the Beatles music. And I, I would say the same thing about this movie. People will still be watching that movie, still learning the lessons. And uh, Angelo, uh, we owe you a, a great debt of gratitude for writing this. And uh, I'm not gonna forget this time, co-producing it. And uh, to everybody in this panel, um, just a great thank you, and in your name, we're going to be making a donation in each of your names to uh, freewheeling community bikes. Uh, one bike, one youth, one relationship at a time, where we provide bikes to uh, needy youth. And uh, just thank you for a great crowd today, and uh, thank you to all these folks, and I'm going to have Trina pass these out. So with that, we're adjourned.